Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN. Earlier today, the House Government Reform Committee heard testimony about ethnic minorities and alleged disparities in cancer treatments. The meeting was requested by Maryland Democratic Congressman and Committee Member Elijah Cummings. It was chaired by Congressman Dan Burton. It's about two hours and ten minutes. Good afternoon, a quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses' written opening statements be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular materials referred to be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Over the past two years, the Committee on Government Reform has held several hearings on cancer issues. We've examined the importance of early cancer detection and research, the role of complementary and alternative therapies, women's cancers, prostate cancer, and the need to provide patients with their choice of treatment. Today we are looking at the equally important topic of ethnic and racial disparity in cancer treatments. Our colleague, uh, Mr. Cummings, requested this hearing in order to raise the level of awareness of disparities in care as well to, as to explore possible solutions to this problem. We all know the devastating impact cancer has had on our society. One in four deaths in the United States is attributed to this terrible affliction, and one in three Americans will develop some form of cancer in their lifetimes. This year alone, some 552,000 Americans are expected to die of cancer. Cancer is a disease that is colorblind. It strikes all social, economic, cultural, and ethnic groups in America. But it often takes the deadliest toll among minorities. Although many ethnic minority groups experience significantly lower levels of some types of cancers than the majority of the U.S. white population, other ethnic minorities experience higher cancer cancer incidence and mortality rates. Let's just look at a few of these examples. The incidence and mortality rates for multiple myeloma rose sharply in the United States from the 1950s to the 1980s, then leveled off. The rates for Afro-Americans were twice as high as for whites. Asian Americans are five times more likely to die from liver cancer associated with hepatitis. Vietnamese women suffer cervical cancer at nearly five times the rates of white women. Hispanics have had two to three times the rates of stomach cancer. According to a UAW Ford report, the overall mortality rates for Afro-Americans is in the five county area around Kansas City is 63% higher than for whites in the same area. In Wisconsin, death rates from cancer for Afro-Americans rose 3% while death rates for whites decreased by 2%. Breast cancer occurs less often in Afro-American women than white women, but it is typically detected later. Af African-American males develop cancer 15% more frequently than white males. These are just a few examples of the racial disparities we see in cancer rates and death. They are complex and not well understood. They can be related to a higher incidence of cancer, to later detection, and to cancers not being treated as well. Research has shown that all three of these factors contribute to the disparity in mortality. I am pleased that two of my colleagues are here today to talk about legislation they have introduced to deal with these issues. Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr. and Benny Thompson have both introduced bills to elevate to a center the Office of Research on Minority Health at the National Institutes of Health. I am pleased that Dr. Ruffin, the Associate Director for Research on Minority Health, and Dr. Otis Brawley from the Office of Special Populations at the National Cancer Institute are joining us today to answer our questions. Dr. Harold Freeman is returning to testify to the committee today on behalf of both the National Institutes of Health as well as the North General Hospital. 
Last year, an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine indicated that in early stage lung cancer, um, Afro African Americans receive less aggressive treatment than white individuals. The author of this research paper, Dr. Peter Bach, of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center is here today to share insights from this research. I'm also pleased that we will hear from Dr. Linda Thompson of the Center for Community Partnerships for Children and Families in Baltimore, Maryland, and Dr. Elmer Huerta of the American Cancer Society. The hearing record will remain open until October 10th. Mr. Cummings, would you like to make an opening statement? Thank you very, thank you very much, Madam Chair Lady. Um, I want to thank you for chairing this meeting today, and I want to take a moment to thank Chairman uh, Burton for convening this hearing at my request entitled Ethnic Minority Disparities in Cancer Treatment, Why the Unequal Burden. On June 8th, this committee held a hearing on the accessibility of complementary and alternative medicines for cancer treatments, during which racial disparities in treatment were briefly examined through testimony given by Dr. Harold Freeman, who will testify today. However, as I requested, this, this hearing today affords us the opportunity to engage in a more exhaustive investigation of the disparity issue as it relates to conventional treatments for cancer. I requested this hearing in response to a study published by the New England Journal of Medicine in October of 1999, which reported that African-American patients with early stage lung cancer are less likely than whites to undergo life-saving surgery, and as a result, are more likely to die of this disease. I'm pleased to see that one of the principal investigators of the study, Dr. Peter Bach, is here with us today to testify. The treatment disparities revealed in the study were of great concern to me, particularly when considered along with other data regarding cancer incidents and mortality rates among minorities as compared to the majority population. In fact, disturbingly, the incidence rate for lung cancer in African American and Native Hawaiian men is higher than in white men. Hispanics suffer elevated rates of cervical and liver cancer, and Alaskan Native and African American women have the first and second highest all cancer and lung cancer mortality rates among females. Cancer has also surpassed heart disease as the leading cause of death for Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese populations. Further, while surgery is the treatment option for lung cancer in its early stages, only 64 percent of African Americans had surgery at this stage, as compared to 76.7 percent of white Americans. And paralleling recommended treatment options, <coughs> cancer death rates among African Americans are about 35 percent higher than that for whites. And in my district of Baltimore City, 251 African Americans per every 100,000 people die of cancer each year as compared to 194 of whites. These statistics are compelling and lead us to question why such disparities exist among races. Numerous studies have determined that race is not just a biological category. Race reflects the intersection of biological, cultural, socioeconomic, political, and legal determinants. As such, to address the unequal burden in minority health, we must examine how all of these determinants, individually and collectively, play a role in creating existing health disparities. We must examine whether the trends in racial and ethnic differences in health are due to genetic factors, do socioeconomic factors such as income and cultural mores, including diet, have a significant impact? Or, as Dr. Bach's study suggests, do disparities result from racism and discrimination, which can lead to psychological stress and can restrict access to health care, education, housing, and recreation facil recreational facilities, all key components to a healthy life. 
Is such racism and discrimination institutionalized within the medical industry such that preventive measures and treatment options are limited for minorities? The goal of this hearing is to explore these very questions and further to examine how such disparities can be eliminated. I understand that key ways to address the issue include increased data collection and research towards the implementation of effective prevention, treatment, and health programs, the appropriate levels of health and social services, and non-discriminatory access to health care. However, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on this issue. I am particularly interested in the testimony of my colleagues, Representative Jesse Jackson, Jr. of Illinois, and Representative Benny Thompson of Mississippi, regarding legislation aimed towards these goals, and I thank them for their appearance here today, and I thank them for their concern. Our nation is in a race for the cure. However, we must be mindful that this race against cancer must be run by and for all Americans. The entry into this contest should not be dependent on your race, but must be based on your humanity. And winning the race for a quality, healthy life must be a victory for every citizen, no matter their race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. As we move closer to crossing that victory line, I will remain committed to the bioethical principles of justice, fairness, which all call for one standard of health in this country for all Americans, not an acceptable level of disease for minorities and another for the minority population. And I thank you. With that, I close, uh, Madam Chair Lady, and I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummings, and thank you very much for requesting uh, that we proceed with this hearing. Uh, I might just mention that our chairman, Mr. Burton, is on the way, but he was uh, delayed by traffic, and so he asked me to uh, act in his stead. But he will be arriving uh, later on in the afternoon, so uh, I have the opportunity to do this. Uh, our first panel is uh, Representative uh, from Illinois, Jesse Jackson, and Representative Benny Thompson from Mississippi. Uh, on behalf of the committee, we welcome you here today. And if you'd please proceed with your opening statements, and we'll start with you, uh, Congressman Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. I want to thank you for this opportunity to discuss health disparities, and particularly an issue uh, that I am concerned about, minority health research at the National Institute of Health. I am very pleased to join my colleague, Congressman Thompson, on this panel to share ideas and concrete steps this Congress may take to address health status disparities in this country between African Americans and other ethnic minorities and that of the general population. I also want to take this time to thank uh, Congressman Cummings for asking for this hearing and for working with me and Congressman Thompson on advancing this very important issue and helping to ensure that no American is left behind. I want to start by saying that the concept of elevating the Office of Research on Minority Health, Chairman Biggert, to center status and ensuring culturally competent curricula at medical schools is a first step, but an important step, in a long journey to end domestic health disparities. We still need to address the issues of access, of prevention and treatment in a comprehensive manner. In this time of national economic prosperity and double-digit growth for the National Institute of Health, I am disappointed to report that the health status gap among blacks and other underserved populations is getting worse and not better. In fact, African American males develop cancer, as Congressman Cummings said, 15 percent more frequently than white males. For men and women combined, African Americans have a cancer death rate of 35 percent higher than that for whites. In addition, the incident rate for lung cancer in African American men is about 50 percent higher than white men. Moreover, several years ago, the Chronicle of Higher Education wrote an article critical of the amount of dollars being spent on minority health research in NIH. The Chronicle article cited that 0.4 percent of extramural research grants were being awarded to African American researchers pursuing these studies. In my view, the National Institute of Health could do more and should be doing more to address, address health care needs for all Americans. At the beginning of the 106th Congress, I was pleased to be appointed to the House Appropriations Committee and to its Labor, Health and Human Services and Education Subcommittee. Congressman Lewis Stokes of Ohio made gigantic strides in improving minority health during his long and distinguished service on the Labor HHS Ed Subcommittee, and I hope to make a similar contribution. 
One of the many benefits of serving on the subcommittee is the opportunity to carefully review the program activities and the priorities of the Institute and to question the health care professionals and researchers that carry out such vital work. In fact, the Labor HHS subcommittee held more than 40 days of hearings just this year alone, about 20 half-day sessions in which were dedicated to the oversight of NIH. I was privileged to attend almost all of those sessions this year. In January of 1999, I had the privilege of meeting with Dr. Lewis Sull Sullivan, the former HHS secretary and current president of Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Sullivan shared with me the testimony he gave before the Senate Labor HHS Appropriation Subcommittee concerning an Institute of Medicine study, an IOM study, that demonstrated a disturbingly low level of support for cancer research among minorities through the National Cancer Institute. The cornerstone recommendation made by Dr. Sullivan in his testimony was to elevate the existing NIH Office of Research on Minority Health to center status. He contended that the existing structure at NIH did not, I repeat, Madam Chair, did not adequately address or prioritize the issue of health disparities. After asking scores of questions to NIH directors and directors of the institute and centers during last year's hearings about these disparities, I became more convinced than ever that Dr. Sullivan was right. The Office of Research on Minority Health needed to be elevated to a center and to center status. Consequently, I worked with Dr. Sullivan and other health care professionals to fashion a bill that would do just that. The product of those efforts, H.R. 2391, which I introduced on, Jan on June 30th of 1999, and I'm also pleased to see that Congressman Thompson and Lewis have incorporated Title I of their legislation, H.R. 3250, the Health Care Fairness Act, as essentially the essence of 2391. Madam Chair, the bill in sum does this as I prepare to close. Number one, it provides the director of the center a seat at the table, which they currently do not have, when NIH institutes and centers directors meet to discuss NIH policy and priority directives. Currently, the director of the office does not even attend those meetings. Secondly, it calls for the health status disparities to be prioritized at NIH through the establishment of an NIH-wide strategic plan for health disparities, with the center playing a key role in such a strategic plan. Thirdly, it establishes direct grant-making authority for the National Center guided by the work of scientific expertise of a National Advisory Council. Right now, the office director can't spend his own budget unless an institute director allows him to fund a grant through his or her institute. And lastly, Madam Chair, it provides institutional support for those minority health professions schools which have a history and mission to serve and train minority health professions and conduct research on health status disparities. If we're ever going to solve the problem of health disparities, institutions which have a mission to solve these problems must be strong and viable. Madam Chairman, I urge this committee to look seriously at the pieces of legislation that would elevate the Office of Research on Minority Health to a national center. Elevating this office will help save more lives and families from being sapped by illness and anguish. Together, we can ensure that health care needs of all Americans are adequately addressed. Madam Chair, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to present my views. <clears throat> thank you very much, Congressman Jackson. Uh, Congressman Thompson, would you like to proceed? Thank you, Madam Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings. I associate myself with the comments made by my colleague, Reverend <laughs> Congressman Jackson from Illinois. It's nice to have a famous father. Uh, I, along with Representative Lewis, Watts, Norwood, introduced House Resolution 3250, Health Care Fairness Act of 1999, on November 11th, 1999, in order to address the glaring disparities between the quality of health care received by whites and that received by minorities. Uh, Ms. Madam Chairman, racial and ethnic minorities are not receiving adequate health care. Over the past few decades, we've made great advances as a nation in science and medicine. However, all our citizens have not shared in the benefits of these advances. Minority populations have significantly higher rates of death from cancer and heart disease, as well as higher rates of HIV, AIDS, diabetes, and other severe health problems. We know the, that poverty, lack of health insurance, and other barriers to care are undermining the health of minority communities. However, we've not made the commitment necessary to understanding the generic and behavioral differences that allow and affect health outcomes. In addition, recent studies show that bias in the healthcare system is another factual factor in racial and ethnic health disparities. 
All of us are familiar with all of the studies, Madam Chairman, that document consistently uh, what problems we, we encounter. One that uh, I think is glaring for this hearing is that black men who contract prostate cancer are 133% more, more likely to die than that of white men. Minorities are also underrepresented in medical education and in the health care delivery system. Although blacks, Hispanic, and Native Americans make up 24% of the U.S. population, only 7% of physicians, 5% of dentists, and 6% of medical school faculty members are from one of these minority groups. The Health Care Fairness Act includes an increased commitment to research on minority health, improved data systems, and culturally competent health care delivery. These changes will increase our knowledge of the nature and causes of these disparities and improve the quality and outcome of health care services for minority population. There is an inherent need to include minority health as a top legislative initiative. Just like Medicare reform and affordable prescription drugs for seniors, immediate and decisive action must be taken to address the desperate treatment minorities receive from health care providers. Already, a number of health care studies have released which clearly demonstrate the fact that minorities receive less and or different treatment by health care providers. Madam Chairman, we must make every effort to address these problems and reverse the extremely divert, disturbing trend. My bill is the first step, positive step in that direction. H.R. 3250 has gained the support from both sides of the aisle, along with several health care related organizations. Again, I want to thank my colleagues for their support for this legislation, and I uh, urge that we as members of Congress push for passage of this bill. Uh, parenthetically, Madam Chairman, let me uh, indicate that I represent a congressional district where all 24 counties are medically underserved. Um, we need all the help that we can get. It's the third poorest congressional district in America. And uh, I hope you can understand my passion for uh, this piece of legislation and would encourage the committee's uh, positive report on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Thompson. Uh, we'll have uh, questioning now, uh, and I'll begin. Uh, Congressman Jackson, uh, I, Congressman Thompson just mentioned that, that all of the communities in his area are, are underserved. Are there any existing programs in your district working to Im improve minority access to, uh, to care? There are a number of existing programs and another, a number of existing health care uh, facilities uh, in our district that are seeking to pro provide uh, access and a quality high level of care to the underserved. Um, but the fundamental issue that um, um, plagues NIH is not one that has, is relative to access or availability of care. It's that we have on the Appropriations Committee set out to double NIH's budget over the last five years. Uh, now the budget is roughly $88 billion. And the IOM study showed that 0.4 percent of, um, of extramural grants at NIH were not addressing fundamentally well-coordinated research across the $88 billion that we were spending uh, on, many of these, on many of these concerns. And one of the questions, for example, that came to mind during the course of our inquiry, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, was this. I remember in, uh, raising a question of the uh, head of the National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse. And I asked the director of that center, was he aware of any studies that had occurred on the impact of 40 ounces of malt liquor on the hypothalamus or the medulla oblongata, two very important regions of the brain. And he said at that time that he was not aware of any studies that the National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse had conducted. I told him, was he aware that 
malt liquor is predominantly a liquor that is sold in minority communities, African Americans and Hispanics. He said he was aware uh, of that. At that time, a member of his own panel then interrupted and said, Congressman Jackson, I'm also afraid and very disappointed to tell you that they are now marketing 64 ounces of malt liquor in African American and Hispanic um, um, communities. Um, well, Madam Chairman, needless to say, uh, without studies to study why malt liquor is marketed in our community, the hypothalamus and the medulla oblongata are the re regions of the brain, for example, that remind you that you're married. Um, so if people are consuming this alcohol uh, in our communities and people don't live in these communities, uh, then who is to say whether or not the National Institute of Health shouldn't be offering advisory warnings to corporations don't sell malt liquor in 40 ounce and 64 ounce containers. It maybe should be sold in a 12 ounce container and, uh, and then consumed in only 12 ounces at a time. So these are fundamental problems that need to be coordinated across NIH as this Congress seeks to double its budget and many of these, um, many of these issues are not happening right now at NIH unless there is an office that specifically is aware of those concerns, Madam Chair. Thank you for your question. Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Um, it's 18 billion. 18 billion. Okay. I think our entire labor HHS ed bill is about 106 now, up from 88. Things change around here every every minute. Thank you. Well, I, I certainly share your respect and admiration for the former HHS uh, Secretary, Dr. Lewis Sullivan. And uh, when Dr. Sullivan advised you of his uh, recommendation that. Uh, the Office of, of Research on Minority Health be elevated to a center at NIH. Uh, did he expand on why he felt this would be uh, uh, necessary? And was this his primary recommendation? And did he offer other ways to get at uh, these disparities? Madam Chair, when he um, testified before Senator Specter's committee in the Senate, um, it became clear amongst the senators who were participating in the panel that the lack of coordination, which upon our own inquiry in our labor HHS subcommittee further showed that there was a coordination problem on minority health disparities at the National Institute of Health. Uh, Dr. Sullivan had no other recommendation other than the fact that he felt that this center should be treated like other centers, that it should not have to necessarily relate solely to the director of NIH or get permission in a kind of paternalistic way, that it should be some center that somehow is housed in the director's office, but it should be treated like the other centers with the ability to offer research grants to those institutions that were passion driven. As you know, Madam Chair, research is a passion driven subject, and so people who have lost uh, parents and family members to various diseases who choose to pursue research are often driven by the passion of finding a cure for that which ails a personal family member or personally uh, afflicts or affects uh, their community. The absence of these research grants, these extramural grants at these institutions that are being driven by uh, this passion, Dr. Sullivan suggested was the most uh, fundamental problem and that required its own coordination at its own center. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired, so I'll turn to uh, Congressman Cummings. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Madam uh, Chelly. Um, Representative Thompson, I think you um, you talked about uh, in 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 your, uh, your testimony. I mean, in your legislation, rather, it addresses the issue of cultural competency um, in medical education. Can you, can you help us with that and, and what the significance of that is? It sounds like that's also what J Representative right. Jackson is talking about. Um, the passion. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we have four uh, African-American medical schools in this country. Uh, when we started looking at the research uh, for this bill, we found that in NIH, only four-tenths of one percent of their money went to minority institutions. Uh, so we felt that given the minority population in this country, that was a problem. One of the reasons we're talking about creating this center is to get an elevation uh, or, if you please, a standing that would give additional financing and, and credibility. Uh, the other concern, to be quite honest with you, is uh, everyone has been sympathetic to all these health concerns, but it seems to fall on deaf ears when it comes to research and actual dollars in support of it. 
So one of the reasons we uh, have coined this bill, we also call it a civil rights bill. Uh, in the richest country in the world, it's an absolute travesty that we have statistics for American citizens so glaring as what we have here today that we can't in good conscience not support this bill because it's the right thing to do. And that's that cultural disparity. The, uh, the uh, Representative Jackson, the Office of Minority Research, seems to, um, I, I guess they do some, would you agree that they do uh, accomplish some, some pretty good research? Um, ranking, member, ranking Member Cummings, on our committee, we've been very careful to use uh, the language good research. Yeah. Um, they pursue good research. They don't pursue minority research. They don't pursue black research. They don't pursue substandard research, language that was used by some uh, members uh, of the committee. They pursue good research. And for example, a classic example of good research, at Howard University School of Medicine and one of their research departments, they have a African-American woman who is uh, preeminent in her field for the study of the human genome. They have other members of their faculty who have done outstanding work from the study of the human genome on back across to cancer research and a number of other um, issues that confront uh, minority communities in terms of health research. When many of these professors submitted papers to the NIH for grants and research funding from Howard University, they were denied. Well, one member of the faculty left Howard University and joined another Ivy League, essentially an Ivy League school, did not change one word in their research paper, resubmitted the paper to NIH, and the grant was awarded. So why it wouldn't be awarded when that research professor was at Howard University, but when they then shifted to an Ivy League school, that research was rewarded with a award grant without one word being changed in the proposal is suspect. And that's why you have to create a center at NIH that is specific and that honors and understands the impact and the significance of addressing these health disparities where the passion research must occur. And that's, and I take it that that's why uh, you are promoting and pushing on this grant making authority that you talked about. Yes, sir, I am. And I believe Congressman uh, Thompson's bill, a centerpiece of his bill as well, is the ability of the center to provide research dollars to support good research on these questions. Now, one of the things that we're, we're going to be addressing, some of the witnesses will be addressing uh, later on in the hearing, is this whole idea. And, and, and uh, Chair Lady and, and I addressed it just a few moments ago, is how you can, and I think you both talked about it, how you can have situations where African-Americans uh, may have less incidence of certain cancers, but yet and still, from a percentage standpoint and a number standpoint, they die at greater rates. And, I'm, and, I, and I guess the older I get, the more I'm, I, I'm appreciating the concept of public health um, in that a lot of African-American people and poor people and poor people are dying long before their time. And I'm just wondering, how does this legislation, both of you, and this will be my last question because I see my time is up, how does your legislation address those kind of issues? Mr. Chairman, as I began in my opening remarks, elevating the Office of Research on Minority Health at NIH to a center status, it is my humblest opinion, sir, it does not do that. Uh, this is about research amongst medical institutions amongst research professionals to inspire and to encourage them to pursue research that might be available across NIH that might apply to all Americans. But Congressman Thompson is right when he says that his district is the th third poorest district in America. Uh, that's, it. that's indicative of the absence of trained medical professionals in his district. It's indicative of how rural his district is. It's the same thing in Appalachia. If we weren't sitting here as African Americans, access to health care, quality health care, dollars who can earn, uh, doctors who can earn a reasonable living in that environment, providing them with MRI 
MRIs and CAT scan machines to be able to check for fundamental Ill illnesses and ability to pay are still the fundamental issues that confront our health care system. And as Chairman Biggert indicated in her open opening remarks, the ability to detect many of these diseases early is a significant factor in reducing health disparities. But if in many of our communities, from African Americans to Latinos to those socioeconomic communities that are economically depressed, if they don't feel comfortable going to hospitals and to doctors and to health care clinics because of the myriad of barriers that, conf that confront our own health care delivery system, then we find out these statistics at the tail end of their lives, which oftentimes reduces the lifespan of an American. Well, hey, Congressman Jackson is correct. Uh, you have to have that passion uh, for the research. Uh, if you're not interested in um, minority uh, health outcomes, then there's a great possibility that you won't give it the passion required to come up with good research and, 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 and good data. The other thing is uh, most of the African American doctors in this country uh, happen to graduate from African American medical schools. Uh, we have to enhance that opportunity. Uh, we have to give those schools the best resources possible. Uh, to go back and practice in that medically underserved area. Uh, if we could do that, we could make a tremendous Im impact on the problems associated with inadequate health care delivery system. Uh, a number of grants and contracts, as my bill talks about, is very important. A lot of it has to do with resources. Um, we've documented the problem. We've tried to offer legislation to address it. Uh, if we can get the support, uh, bipartisan support uh, of our bills, uh, I'm convinced that over a period of time uh, we can reduce those numbers so that uh, there won't be a racial disparity attached to health care in this country. Just a la just the last comment. I, as you were talking, both of you were talking, I couldn't help but think about this morning uh, in my district where we have uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University and also University of Maryland both with medical schools, but Johns Hopkins, um, you know, I was just thinking that Johns Hopkins receives hun hundreds of millions of dollars um, yearly and for research. And I was just thinking if you gave a Meharry uh, just some of that, some of that, mm -hmm. it would certainly enhance the school, would create a better environment for those doctors who, students that are coming through there and would give them an opportunity to do the very things that you all have talked about this morning, uh, being service of, giving service to those underserved communities and having some kind of cultural sensitivity at the same time. I want to thank both of you. I really appreciate it. We've been joined by uh, Representative Kucinich. Uh, do you have uh, I, I just wanted to uh, add uh, my support for the legislation sponsored by Mr. Thompson and Mr. Jackson's participation. As someone who uh, served as mayor of a major city and has seen the uh, disparities that you've talked about in, in terms of the demand for health care that often is unmet, uh, you're, the point that you make here is so important. And I think that all of us in the Congress should be working very closely with you to make sure that these issues are addressed so that uh, we can not only wipe out the disparities, but also, even more significantly, attack that very nature of why it is that people are getting cancer anyhow, let alone that they have it more than any, any, anyone else. So I, I salute both of my colleagues for their work on this, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no more questions, then we will uh uh, thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for your, uh, your testimony, and we really appreciate the, the passion that you have for, for this, and I'm thank sure you, we'll Madam be Chair. looking at it further. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And if the next panel would like to come up.
Okay. If you'd all like to stand, uh, it's the committee usually uh, swears everyone in if you're giving testimony or are here to answer questions. So if you'd uh, like to uh, raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you, and be seated, please. See, let the, let the uh, record reflect that the witnesses responded in the affirmative. Uh, on behalf of the committee, we welcome you here today, and I think we will begin with uh, uh, Dr. Freeman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And you're recognized for an opening statement, which is usually about five minutes, and then we will have uh, five minutes of questioning by the, uh, by the uh, committee here uh, after all of you have testified. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman and distinguished uh, congressmen and women. I'm Dr. Harold Freeman, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon about disparities in the diagnosis of, and treatment of cancer and the unequal burden of cancer among minorities, the poor, and the underserved. Uh, this spring, Dr. Klausner, the director of the Cancer Institute, uh, asked me to consult with him on these issues, and later, particularly 24 hours ago, I was appointed as the director of the new Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities, uh, so I, one day old, including sleeping time in this position. Let me point out that profound advances have been made in biomedical science uh, over the last several decades. Many Americans have benefited, but some have not. And there are some groups of people who experience a heavier burden of cancer, mortality, and incidence, particularly certain minorities, the poor, and the underserved. I believe that the unequal burden of, of cancer in our society is a challenge to science and is a moral and ethical dilemma for our nation. Health disparities have been framed historically as racial and ethnic differences, and clearly some races and ethnic groups don't do as well. But the fact of the matter is, as you have pointed out, uh, Congressman Cummings, is that races are not biological categories. They are social and political categories, which we need to keep in mind. The consequences of racism, however, inherent in racial classifications have, for some racial and ethnic groups, been associated with several negative factors. For example, fewer social and educational and economic opportunities associated with racism, greater exposure to stress in unsafe environments, and reduced access to quality health care. Uh, I would like to point out in another role that I have as chairman of the President's Cancer Panel, last year, 1999, we reviewed the National Cancer Institute's history, current status, and evolution. We made one major conclusion, that whereas we have made tremendous progress in the war against cancer since 1971, when Richard Nixon declared that war, uh, research has advanced uh, greatly during that time. But we believe, the panel believes, that there's a critical disconnect between what we discover in America and what we deliver to the American people. And barriers that prevent the benefits of research from reaching all of our populations, particularly those who bear the greatest disease burden, must be identified and removed. In my own work, I have thought a great deal about this. And I have reduced these considerations to three major considerations uh, that cause disparities. Number one is poverty itself, which is a universal effect. Poor people have substandard living conditions. Poor people are less educated, have frequently a risk-promoting lifestyle, and low access to preventive health care. Poverty is a universal human effect but it's disproportionately reflected in certain groups, such as African Americans. A third of African Americans are poor. Uh, African Americans make up only about 12% of our population. The second factor that I think is very critical is culture, uh, including 
communication system, belief systems, um, values, traditions, lifestyles, attitudes, and behaviors, which need to be understood. Now, culture, uh, Madam Chairman, is not equal to race. There are many cultures within a race. But I think in our research, we need to understand what is the culture of our people that may lead to excess incidents and, mort and, and sometimes to mortality. The third factor, which we're here to talk about here today, is social injustice. And social injustice is reflected in studies that we're examining here today, particularly example given by the fact that black Americans presenting with early cancer of the lung, colon, breast, and prostate are less likely to get the curative treatment. Dr. Bach will elucidate this further. What are the reasons that this could happen in America? Correcting for socioeconomic status and whether people have insurance or not, these conditions still hold. Uh, so we need to look at what it is in America that could allow a person or a group of people to present with early cancer, curable cancer, and not get treated in the same way as others. In my own, my own view, um, the answers have to be in two categories. Number one, what is the attitude and the bias of the health care givers? Um, there seems to be an element that needs to be further explored. Number two, what is the level of distrust of the people who are being treated? Uh, we've had a Tuskegee incident here, and I think there is still concern among black people that they may be experimented on. So these two elements need to be further explored. I, I believe that the issue goes very deep. The issue has to do with how American people in one group perceive each other, value each other, and behave toward each other. So the, the question of social injustice, uh, the short arm of it is what's happening today. The long arm of it is what has happened over nearly 400 years in America with respect to social injustice with slavery and legalized segregation. Um, I'd like to, to end, because I believe my time is, is probably up, with the general statement I believe that we're in a very critical time in America. Uh, we have made great advances in science. Those advances are not being evenly applied across our population. Poverty seems to be a determining factor, but also social injustice has a bearing. And so I believe that in our studies to come, we must learn more about these differences in populations, uh, whether they're intrinsic within the population's culture or whether they're extrinsic related to how people are being treated in our society. One thing that we need to do is to create standards of care for all American people and know what they are. We need to monitor those standards to see that everyone is treated in the same way. And we need to develop a country that has health providers that are very diverse, uh, that, that reflect the country that we really are, so that the issue of sensitivity of how people are getting, get, getting treated in our society will, will somewhat be improved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, we'll proceed then to uh, Dr. Bach. Uh, thank you very much. Although cancer incidence rates are only 13% higher in blacks than in whites in the United States, mortality rates from cancer in blacks exceed that of whites by 33 percent. Lung cancer ranks number one amongst these cancer killers and claims the lives of more than 150,000 people each year. Just as in cancer overall, we have known for a while that lung cancer disproportionately affects black Americans. Today, when compared to white Americans, black Americans are disproportionately affected by lung cancer in two ways. First, they are at an increased risk of developing lung cancer. Second, they have a far shorter survival after they are diagnosed with lung cancer. Our research group 
based at Memorial Sloan, cancer, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York and at the National Cancer Institute here in Bethesda, conducted a study that was published in October of 1999 to examine this latter problem. Specifically, why is survival shorter for black patients than white patients after a diagnosis of lung cancer? Our focus was on the survival of black and white patients who were diagnosed at a potentially curable stage because we knew that even among these patients, black patients have much poorer survival than white patients. To illustrate this point, let me give you some survival statistics for the patients we studied. Black and white patients, 65 years and older, who have potentially curable lung cancer. During the years of our study, we saw that 34% of white patients who, uh, beginning our study, were alive five years after diagnosis, while only 26% of the black patients in our study were still alive. We thought, for a number of reasons, that this difference in survival between blacks and whites with potentially curable lung cancer might be due to black patients receiving inferior treatment relative to that received by white patients. So we designed a study to address two questions. First, are black and white patients who are diagnosed with potentially curable lung cancer equally likely to get the best available treatment, specifically surgical removal of their cancer? Second, if treatment rates are unequal, then to what extent do differences in treatment account for the overall lower survival rates that we see in black patients? Our study had some special features I'd like to point out. First of all, we addressed our questions by analyzing the National Cancer Institute's SEER database. This comprehensive cancer incidence database is the primary source for most cancer statistics. Second, we limited our analysis to patients who were over, who were 65 years or older. And therefore, all of the patients in our study had Medicare insurance at the time that they were diagnosed. Therefore, we knew that any differences in treatment that we observed would not be due to differences in insurance coverage. With the caveat that our findings only report on results for patients 65 years and older, we found two things. First, while 77% of white patients underwent surgery for their lung cancer, only 64% of black patients underwent surgery. And this difference was highly statistically significant. Second, although overall there were the large survival differences between whites and blacks that I've mentioned a little earlier, we saw that those black and white patients who were treated equally also had equal survival. The consequence of these two findings put together is that differences in treatment are responsible for a large part of the difference in survival that exists between black and white patients with early stage lung cancer. I should emphasize that this difference in treatment was not due to differences in insurance coverage, as I've already mentioned. All of these patients had Medicare insurance. Also, this difference in treatment was not due to differences in socioeconomic status. Even among those white and black persons who were in the lowest income quartiles in our study, we saw that 71% of poor white patients would have surgery for lung cancer, while only 63% of poor black patients underwent surgery. And this difference also was highly statistically significant. We cannot determine from the study why black patients receive inferior treatment. Our study does provide an estimate for the magnitude of the difference in treatment received by blacks and whites and also documents that this difference in treatment is responsible for some of the observed survival differences that we see in lung cancer. At Memorial Sloan Kettering, we are continuing our efforts to understand and improve the treatment of black persons with lung cancer. We have formed a partnership with North General Hospital in Harlem in collaboration with Dr. Freeman to expand the screening and treatment services that we are able to offer for persons in need. In addition, the American Lung Association of New York City and the National Cancer Institute have both continued to provide our research group with funds so that we can continue our inquiry into the disparities we see in both cancer treatment and survival. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. For your insight. Uh, Dr. Thompson, I'd like to proceed. Madam Chair, Ranking Member Cummings and the rest of the committee, thank you for asking me to talk about what we're doing at the University of Maryland to reduce disparities. I would like to just highlight some of the things that we're doing for African American males and some of the community level interventions we're doing at the university. 
Faculty and students of the School of Nursing reach out to communities in Maryland by providing direct primary care to medically and geographically underserved populations in a number of innovative models. Faculty and students operate a community-based health center which brings low-cost health care services to inner-city community and Baltimore City, as well as manage and staff 14 school-based and school-linked clinics throughout the, the state. Other examples of initiatives that we do is we offer, we conduct six mobile health units that are staffed by the School of Nursing and faculty. These services are, are, we take mobile health services to vulnerable populations in the state. We also train lay workers to conduct outreach education and support in high-risk communities throughout the state of Maryland. Hundreds of individuals thought of as hard to reach are touched by these services. Lives are being saved through these primary health care initiatives. For years, my colleagues at the University of Maryland have researched the health problems facing African Americans in this country. We have worked to better understand African American males, their, cultur their cultural beliefs and practices, and how they are impacted by public health. The results of clinical studies show that lack of accurate knowledge about cancer and cultural misconceptions are major barriers to increasing the number of African American men who participate in early screening and treatment. Our research has also shown, shown that encouragement by loved ones and friends can encourage healthy lifestyles. More research is needed, however, to better understand these factors and their impact on behavior and to design more culturally specific innov innovations that can motivate African American men to seek early cancer screening and care. Through funding from the National Cancer Institute, the Maryland Special Populations um, Cancer Network partnered with community-based organizations to address black male cancer disparities in Baltimore City, Maryland's Eastern Shore, and Southern Maryland. In July, the university held a cancer prevention workshop for, uh, within the state, and we reached hundreds of people who spoke candidly about the cancer prevention needs of minorities and lack of educational resources that are available to meet their needs. At the University of Maryland Baltimore, researchers are looking at ways to reduce cost as we continue to try to provide quality health care services. We believe that primary prevention is the moral and cost effective course to take. We are convinced that effective reduction in cancer incidence and mortality among African American men requires community based education and public health efforts specifically tailored for them. We know from data from the World Health Organization that access, availability, and acceptability of services are important in order to prevent health, to provide pre uh, preventive health care. Lack of in health insurance remains a critical problem to trying to serve high-risk communities. Preventive cancer screening is critical, and we need to develop workable strategies in order to reach people in, throughout this, the country. I have seen in, in my practice many men who come in for care who, are, who, uh, who work every day and are unable to get the services they, that they need until they're disabled. We need to try to reduce this, 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 this disparity and, because it increases the burden of health care uh, cost. I am, I am convinced that with increased federal funding, we would be able to provide targeted primary health care services to uh, communities. The strategies we suggest in order to reduce the disparity is to provide more direct primary health care services to high-risk minority communities. Nurse-managed clinics and accessible mobile vans are strategies that we have seen that could be used to reach high-risk communities. The use of lay workers is also an effective way to outreach to communities. If we are to successfully eliminate minority health disparities, we much, must make every opportunity to reach African American men. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. And now, uh, Dr. Huerta. Uh, buenas tardes. 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elmer Huerta, and I'm the founder and director of the Cancer Risk Assessment and the Screening Center at the Washington Cancer Institute at the Washington Hospital Center here in Washington, D.C. I'm the founder of a clinic that has a theme, says, if you are sick, this is not a place for you. This is for healthy people only. And over 7,500 people have crossed our doors in five years. But you cannot imagine how much I shiver every time I have an uninsured person coming for cancer screening. And I wonder myself how this wonderful and powerful country can allow its citizens to have this bad time. I'm pleased here to appear before as a member of the National Board of Directors of the American Cancer Society. As you may know, the American Cancer Society is the nationwide community-based voluntary health organization dedicated to eliminating cancer as a major health problem by preventing cancer, saving lives, and diminishing suffering from cancer through research, education, advocacy, and services. Most of my work as a physician has focused in providing care to those in greatest need. My dedication has been to my community which primarily represents Latinos and African Americans in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Allow me to share a little about them. Many of my Latino patients have origins outside of these borders, of our borders. They are Americans, nonetheless, who are exploding in numbers and make up an increasing number of the United States workforce. As for my African American patients, some of them are native Washingtonians whose ancestors helped build this wonderful city we know as the capital, where decisions are made daily that affect the lives of all Americans. Despite the history and the many contributions made by these populations, they are not pictures of health. Too many of them are uninsured, unemployed, and at increased risk for cancer and other chronic diseases. We all know people, friends, neighborhoods, and loved ones who are surviving cancer today in greater number than before. The evidence of decreasing cancer mortality is encouraging and presents a compelling argument for accelerating our national investment in prevention, early detection, and scientific research. However, the higher cancer incidence and death rates among minorities and medically underserved populations suggest that not all Americans are equally benefiting from scientific breakthroughs and cancer prevention and control efforts. So we ask ourselves, why do disparities exist and how can we address this problem? For starters, let me give you a snapshot of this crisis. As a nation, we spend one trillion each year on health care, yet only 1% of that goes to population-based prevention efforts. That translates into less than a penny a day per person. Surgeon General David Satcher emphasized this startling fact at the launching of Healthy People 2010. Primary prevention strategies such as tobacco control, nutrition, and physical activity do save lives and reduce the human, economic, and social costs of cancer and other diseases. It seems to me that most of our medical establishment is very interested in Mrs. Smith's tumor. What I request from you is that we must focus on Mrs. Smith herself. The American Cancer Society has identified several areas of promise that will help us tackle these challenges, some of which, some, uh, some which are captured in the Institute of Medicine report on the unequal burden of cancer. I respectful, respectfully urge the committee to consider the following recommendations. I assure you that the American Cancer Society stands ready to assist you in any way. First, we must sustain and expand the proven research programs that have enabled us to pursue a path of scientific excellence and discovery in cancer research, while also seizing extraordinary opportunities to further the progress made by our previous research success. Second, we must focus on the strategies that involve communities in creating and delivering the programs that will reduce and eliminate the unequal burden of cancer with government providing the support and resources critical for success. Next, 
we must place a greater focus on prevention and early detention effort and early detection efforts. That means bringing cancer screenings to the people instead of waiting for them to come to us. We must continue our effort to build awareness through creative, creative approaches utilizing channels such as the media, radio, our school, and our churches. Resources need to be directed towards development of culturally competent programs that will better reach and serve medically underserved populations. We must continue to fund research. We must certainly apply what we know about cancer prevention, early detection, and treatment equally to all communities to ensure that all Americans benefit from the progress we have made in the 20th century. Eliminating disparities is critical to the success of our national cancer program and to improving the lives of all American families. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. We'll uh, now turn to the questioning and at, at five minutes. Uh, the other two witnesses are, are going to answer questions that we might have. In fact, I think I will We'll begin by uh, asking Dr. Ruffin. Um, I think that, as you know, the National Institutes of Health has traditionally opposed the creation of any new centers. So what is uh, the, the NIH position on uh, the two bills that have been introduced by uh, Congressman Jackson and, and Congressman Thompson to elevate the Office of Research uh, on Minority Health to a center? Yeah. Madam, <clears throat> Madam Chairman, if you'd permit me just to make one sentence before I get to the um, answer of your question. But I wanted to say, uh, in light of much of the testimony that had been provided here, that my office, the Office of Research on Minority Health, was created 10 years ago uh, during the tenure of um, then Secretary Lewis Sullivan. And I must say to you that over that 10 year period of time, uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, go to various parts of this country and listen to testimony much the way you're listening to it here today. Uh, we've held hearings around the country where more than a thousand people uh, have testified and individuals who are survivors of various chronic diseases, not just cancer, but heart disease and diabetes, uh, scientists, uh, as well as politicians and others have come before the committee. And I think today you've heard a number of concepts and terms that have been mentioned to you that when we look at outcome, much of this may be due to biology. Some of it may in fact be due to socioeconomics. Some may be due to legal and political and poverty and racism, all in terms of what the health outcome is going to be eventually. And I think in a nutshell, I must say to you that much of what we've learned from many of these hearings around the country is that in fact, these outcomes are due to all of the above. They all play a special role in some form or fashion. The point is we must get to the point in this country where we stop passing the buck, where those who are in the box that has to do with biology say that no, it's not mine, it's really for the socioeconomics, that it's all about poverty, it's about all the above and until partnerships are built between all those boxes, then we're gonna be here talking about this for a long, long time. Now to your specific question, um, I think yes, the answer, and there's no denying of that fact that in the early going at the National Institutes of Health, uh, there was some skepticism about what would happen if in fact a Center for Research on Minority Health was created at the NIH. I think there is absolutely no doubt about it that we've come a long ways and that that thought no longer persists. The National Institutes of Health is convinced that the elevation of the office to center can play a very, very important role in the solution uh, to this great problem. Thank you very much. Uh, before I forget uh, to do some housekeeping, it, it appears that uh, Chairman Burton's plane has been further delayed by the weather. If you've looked outside, I guess, the last couple hours, you know that that has happened. And so that he has asked that his statement be included in the, in the record. So without objection, that would be so ordered. Uh, I think, well, we'll uh, I'll then turn to uh, 
uh, Dr. Brawley and ask uh, you about what are, are some of the projects that the National Cancer Institute has sponsored to date to look at the ethnic and, and racial disparities in uh, cancer care? Um, Madam Chairwoman, the, um, the Institute uh, a few years ago established what was called the Office of Special Populations Research, which I direct. And we have looked at a number of the studies that have been done by the Institute over the last decade and actually shown that by race, equal treatment yields equal outcome. There are also a number of studies, Dr. Box being the latest and perhaps the best done, that in indicate that there is not equal treatment in the United States. And so the Cancer Institute has really been doing both the work to demonstrate that equal treatment yields equal outcome, as well as to try to get uh, a little bit more uh, word out, uh, if you pardon me saying that, that there is not equal treatment. Uh, this includes things such as the uh, Special Populations Networks, which Dr. Thompson actually has one of the 18 grants with Dr. Claudia McKay at the University of Maryland, uh, as well as several other leadership initiatives, as well as uh, work with our Cancer Information Service. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired, and I think we'll probably have several rounds of questions. But unfortunately, I have to go to the floor to uh, do something else on government reform. So we've been joined by uh, Representative Horn, who is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Management, Information, and Technology, who will take the chair. Thank you. And Mr. Cummings, do you want to proceed? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair Lady. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to join you on the floor shortly. Uh, I have a bill on the floor, and I don't know how much you all know about that, but when you have a bill that's your bill that you sponsored, you have to go to the floor. <laughs> but, I, uh, but I'm going to get in as much as I can. Um, you know, I, I, I guess, uh, Dr. Bach, um, I'm just wondering, after you all did your research at Sloan Kettering and you saw that this disparity, um, did that change uh, your policies at all? Did you do things any differently than what you were doing them? After all, you could clearly see from your own uh, testimony that people were probably dying um, early. And I was just curious, did you all do anything differently? Oh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, um, we were concerned by the results of the study, um, but uh, thought it offered, offered a great opportunity for improving the survival of uh, black patients with lung cancer in that uh, if, if black patients were to receive surgical treatment at equal rates to white patients, we should uh, virtually eliminate the survival gap. Uh, the study um, which I was discussing was actually a national study uh, uh, located in 10 geographic regions of the United States. New York wasn't one of them, and so we don't know uh, much through that study about patterns of care in New York City per se. Uh, we at the center are obviously concerned about the health of all of our patients and uh, attempt to provide the best care to all of them. If that were done at your hospital, do you think you might have a similar result? I, I don't have any information about that. Dr. Thompson, one of the things that we've noticed um, in Baltimore, there's a, for some reason, people seem to believe that when they're cut, I've heard this so many times as a young boy, when they're cut and they have cancer, that the cancer will automatically uh, spread and, and, and lead to their deaths. I don't know if any of you all have heard that. Um, and people really believe that. And I'm just wondering, um, have you heard those kind of statements? And how do we deal with those when you're talking about uh, addressing the issue of cancer? I have heard that anecdotally from patients. I know when we held the forum with several, with hundreds of people throughout the state coming to tell us what they wanted, people generally wanted more information. They, they needed and they asked for education so that they would know what to do, where to go for treatment, what were the signs and symptoms. 
they, we, we really need to do a better job in educating the public and educating African Americans about cancer, cancer disparities, and then what to do if they have certain symptoms. Because that's what we, we have found from research. People tend to wait. People are afraid that if they go into certain facilities for care, they might be guinea pigs, so there are some misconceptions there. And we also have seen some misconceptions on healthcare providers' side, not uh, saying that they don't know how to reach out to people, one. The second thing that they say is that maybe African Americans are not interested in participating in, in research and, and clinical trials, and that's also not true, because from the research we know that they are interested. So there needs to be uh, a way that we can begin to bring together our knowledge with the people in need and have some way of, of, of having a balance between those two, because if we're not able to do that, then we're going to tend to continue to not reach people and this information that people have about what cancer may do, the, if you have surgery, this is going to happen. We really need to get good, good information out to the public. Dr. Uh, Ruffin, the results of Dr. Box tested, did, did they surprise you with regard to the, the study on lung cancer? Not really. I think that one of the things that concerned me and to comment to some extent on what uh, Dr. Thompson just said is that the solution to much of this also reside in the relationship, doctor-patient relationship. There's no question in my mind when I talk to some of my majority friends uh, who've had to face major decisions about their health and had to choose in some instances between radiation and surgery. And I've asked them, what was the major factor in your deciding one way or the other? And let me tell you that the major factor was doctor-patient relationship, the fact that they had a good relationship with their physician. All of us sometimes walk into a doctor's office with misconceptions. But if we do not feel comfortable, and if the doctor doesn't feel comfortable with us, if we go in there with misconceptions, we come out with misconceptions. And so it has to be a way, and sometime when we're talking about health issues and you hear us talking about training, people talk about these two issues as if there's a major separation. But there's a close connect between when we talk about research and when we talk about training have to figure out a better way of training our physicians so that that cultural competence that is needed uh, can be there. Just one, just one follow-up sure. question. Please. You know, um, a few years ago when we started moving more and more towards managed care, in my district, and I'm sure districts throughout the entire country, you had people who, uh, particularly elderly people or middle-aged people who had worked with doctors just about all their adult lives, and then suddenly, for various reasons, maybe their doctor wasn't on the list and they found themselves with new doctors. And, um, and, I've, and just following up on what you just said, I imagine that that could play a part too. You, move, you, got, you have a new doctor, you're unfamiliar with that person, um, and that person telling you something is one thing, but that person who you've been with for the last 25 years telling you is a whole other thing. So it's that you think the trust factor is very significant. Oh, there's no doubt in my mind. Now, those individuals who's, who are sitting at the table who see patients on a regular basis may be able to comment on that a little bit more. But, but uh, uh, from my experience, I would think that that would be a factor. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Dr. Freeman, I'd like to ask you a few questions. I gather that you recently accepted a position as the Associate Director for Reducing Health Disparities for the National Cancer Institute. Will that uh, position bring you to Bethesda full-time? No, it will not. It, it, it is not a full-time position. Have you had a chance to uh, look at the proposed budget for the National Cancer Institute and what about the aid that they can provide uh, to this very question? Uh, what's your feeling on that? My job started yesterday. Uh, and I we expect you to have all the problems solved by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have the general feeling in, in speaking to Rick Klausner, who, who, who uh, hired me into this position, that he considers this a very, very important issue. 
and, and, and will give the fullest support. It's going to take a while, I think, to determine how money should be spent. Uh, but I, 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 I'm looking at four different things at this point. Number one, I think that we have to have a research division that will do research related to these issues, uh, not just the special population research that, that is going on now, but more larger than that. I think, number two, we need to have a communications uh, division because communication is so critical to preventing disease and to, ins to uh, instructing people how and when they should come in for certain tests according to their cultural understanding. And thirdly, I think that ultimately the, 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 a huge effect will come if the policies that we have in our nation uh, are compatible with, with the problem that we must be, be facing. And so, for example, if, we, if we're discovering things in our discovery system, but we're not delivering them appropriately to all, all of our population, this is a policy issue. So we're going to have a division that is going to be kind of a think tank division to deal with policy. So you can be, you can be well instructed about the, the, the substance of the problems that we face. This is a good time for you to get the, your proposals in because September is when all government agencies have money to reprogram. Yes. And uh, if on the going out of this fiscal year, it's a good opportunity to start pilot projects and uh, hold that money so you can use it. And as I remember, the National Institutes of Health overall can move money around between some of the institutes. And yes. also within the National Cancer Institute, I would assume they could move money around also. And we shouldn't have to wait a year for you to have what you bring to the table. Uh, we shouldn't have to do that. So thank, we need to get you. moving now. Thank you. What specific programs do you think are needed uh, to reduce these disparities? When I was on the Civil Rights Commission, we had studies on this throughout the country, and uh, that was 30 years ago. Well, one... Uh, one, one question that, that we have uh, is to try to determine what the precise variables are that cause disparity. Uh, we, we, have, we have groups according to race and culture, but we don't know enough about what the precise variables are that cause people not to do as well. For example, uh, is how much of this is related to lack of knowledge and, and resources? Uh, how much of it is related to the lifestyle factors that we all live within, which we call culture? How much of it is related to what we're talking about here today, the matter of social injustice? How, how, how can we separate, disentangle the meaning of, of race as we use it in this society from the meaning of class and culture? These are some of the early questions. Uh, another question is, what about parts of the country that we already know how to identify where people are dying at a higher rate? geographically and culturally delineated areas of excess mortality. In 1989, I published a paper in the New England Journal that showed, for example, that black Americans, particularly males, in Harlem have less of a chance of reaching age 65 than males growing up in Bangladesh, which is a third world uh, country. We need to look and learn from the communities of America how, what we should do for the most distressed communities, uh, and this is one of the areas, uh, lines of uh, research that I will take. What about the research of minorities in the military where they move around, they aren't in a ghetto here in the domestic United States? Uh, is that worthy of research? It is, and there's a recent paper, and there's more than one, but uh, a recent one in May, uh, which looked at the veterans' hospitals uh, I mean, the, the people in the service, the women who develop cervical cancer, who were the wives or perhaps they were soldiers themselves. And, and when they looked at the results, they found, as Dr. Brawley has said, that when people of any race are treated with the same treatment at the same stage of disease, the outcome is, is the same. And so our military model is one perhaps we need to look at very, very closely because 
uh, apparently the access is the same for people who are in the Army or Navy. Uh, and, and so America can learn. So we need to look at those uh, military models. Uh, obviously, one's socioeconomic status does have something to do with this. I mean, may, I, may I just point out this, that in a study which I published on, and I'll give you this to keep, uh, the, the effect of poverty uh, related to race, uh, a, a paper published in 1989 uh, based on American Cancer Society two-year study, trying to understand the effect of poverty on cancer outcome, we concluded that when one corrects for socioeconomic status, the, the results between blacks and whites are, are to a large extent, but not completely corrected. So poverty, with its effect on living conditions, lack of education, nutrition, um, uh, access to preventive care and lifestyle factors, has a major influence on these disparities but poverty is a universal point. It, it affects all people who are poor. I would think in some cases, though, that it isn't just uh, the socioeconomic status, as you mentioned, or you want to call it cultural. The, the foods they ate as little kids, they might still like. And we know yeah. fats and other things certainly don't help matters. That's true. And, and, and before you came in, we spoke of the meaning of culture. Uh, the lifestyle, attitude, and behavior of groups of people who have who have similar uh, lifestyles. The the, the Seventh Day Adventists, to give you an example, have the lowest cancer death rate in America and the longest lifespan. Even when they are poor, they don't smoke cigarettes, they eat vegetables, and they don't drink alcohol. So there's something about lifestyle that is very very critically important across across race. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Friedman. Uh, let's ask Dr. Ruffin a question or two. Uh, what's the ratio of minorities going into medical and nursing schools, and how's that different from the white population? I don't, I don't have those statistics before me, um, but I could provide those to you for the for the record. But let without me, objection. But let me tell you. Here. Pardon me. I say without objection, it's put in the record at yes, this point. Yes, but let me, let me um, answer it this way. Those numbers are very, very low in terms of the number of minorities that are going into, into those professions. And we have many, many programs at the National Institutes of Health that we put in place to try and get those numbers up. Uh, do we know uh, that the cancer treatments differ for Asian Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, Native Alaskans? What, what do we see there? I, I think that we will see some of these across the board when we look at, at uh, some of the statistics, particularly when we start examining different, different groups. Uh, for example, if we were looking at um, uh, Asian Americans, um, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that as it relates to, as it relates to cancer in general, that, uh, for example, I think, and Dr. Freeman may know a, a little bit better the current statistics on this, but that there is an increase in colon cancer among Japanese Americans when they leave Japan and come to the United States. By the same token, as I understand it, stomach cancer, for example, which, which, is, which is relatively high in Japan, but when those individuals come to the United States, there's a decrease in, in stomach cancer. So that suggests to me that there are environmental factors, too, that must be examined as we examine this, this broad scenario of, of, of uh, health outcomes. Well, I've uh, stepped beyond my minutes, and I now yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I just, um, Mr. W uh, Dr. Huerta, um, I just want to know what your thoughts are on the impact of including funding for cultural competency in um, medical education. I think um, Representatives Jesse Jackson Jr. and Benny Thompson talked about that. And I was just curious as to your feelings and how would that affect the population you serve? Uh, thank you for the Thanks for the question, Mr. Cummings. It would tremendously affect the quality of service we can provide to our patients. As an anecdote, I had a patient with pancreatic cancer some years ago. He 
He used to be from the, he was from the Re Dominican Republic. So we, I diagnosed the cancer, and next day he came with 11 members of his family. Mm -hmm. But the amazing thing is that when the family came to see me, they didn't let him get inside my room. The family wanted to talk to me before that, and they plead me not to tell him the truth. Mm. So I'm from Peru. I'm a recently arrived to this country. In Peru, if you tell a patient that the patient has cancer, you are considered an inhuman doctor, inhuman doctor. That's culture. It's incomprehensible for many Americans, but that is culture. So if a, a doctor here doesn't know that subtle changes in the culture of people, how can we treat, how can we treat with, with quality to an Asian American person, a Latino person, a Middle Eastern person, or an African American person? We all have different qualities, and medical schools now, they lack this kind of training. I think we have to allow our medical students to open their eyes, open their minds, that this society of us is becoming increasingly multicultural. Medicine reflects society, in my opinion, quality of care is not reflecting those changes in our demographics. Now, Dr. Brawley, um, you know, when you think about uh, this whole idea, I, I keep going back to Dr. Pop Bach's um, study um, where you have uh, these 65 people, 65 and older. Am I right, Dr. Bach? Yes. And for some of them to uh, get uh, surgery and others not, mm -hmm. and apparently surgery does make a difference. Um, what, I mean, what conclusions do you come yeah. to, if any, yeah. with regard to that? One can look at virtually every major cancer. I personally wrote the literature on prostate cancer and find the same finding that Dr. Bach had. Uh, one, breast cancer, which I've become very interested in, is, is a good example of looking at this. In the military, by the way, black women in the military have a much lower breast cancer mortality than black women in the United States as a whole, partially because of cultural differences between black women who are either married to a soldier or in the service themselves partially because they have access to care, they have access to convenient care, and you have access to good care, which is the other factor. And there are also some hospitals like Henry Ford Hospital or the University of Chicago that have published their series over the last 20 or 30 years and find that blacks and whites treated at those places have equal outcome if you look at them at 5, 10, and 15 years. This is especially important because in 1980, black and white women had the same death death rate in the United States. But since 1980, the death rate has gotten wider and wider, blacks going up and whites going down. Uh, ultimately, uh, how, people get how people get their care, uh, care in county hospitals or in other facilities uh, where sometimes perhaps they say, no, I don't want the treatment. Other times they are denied the treatment. Uh, I've actually been to uh, one hospital uh, in the Midwest where uh, it's a county hospital. They are giving radiation off of a cobalt machine, which has been obsolete for 30 years. But this is where people who are poor go to get their medical care. For them, a mastectomy is the only treatment for breast cancer. Lumpectomy and radiation is not an option because that machine can't give the powerful radiation you need for that care. Sometimes it's because people have to wait in line or wait all day to see a doctor. They just get fed up and they leave. I actually found this out because we've done studies at the NCI to show that there are areas of the country where one out of 20 black women diagnosed with breast cancer do not get treated. They had enough access to care that they got a biopsy of the breast to be diagnosed, but they ultimately did not get the tumor removed. Now that's research that was completed in 1890 that is not being applied in the year 2000. Dr. Thompson, just one other question, Mr. Chairman. Um, have you seen, situa seen situations where people, because of age, uh, just want to give up? I mean, they find out they have cancer and they just want to give up and they just don't 
they just feel like they, it's, there's no need to continue, although doctors may say otherwise? Well, I have a close friend whose mother just died of cancer, and she um, just gave up because she didn't want to go through the treatment. That was the choice. So that's one person that I know of personally who made that choice of not getting care because she didn't want to live with the consequences of having to, to go through a certain type of surgery. And I'm sure other people have had those experiences too where you give information to, a, to a, a patient and tell them what they need to do in order to survive and that they make that choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead if you'd like. I, I see Ms. Norton is here, so I just, but I just have just a few other mm -hmm. just questions. Um, let me ask you this. I, I won't be long. Um, when we look, uh, Dr. Ruffin, at this whole question of um, elevating the office, uh, the research office, um, do you think it will have the kind of, you heard the testimony of Congressman Jackson and, and Thompson, do you think it will have the kind of impact that um, they're hoping for? In other words, if, that, if, if it is elevated, and what differences do you, would you project? I think so. I think so, and I, and I think so for two reasons. Um, one is that it would be the first time uh, that the National Institutes of Health would attempt to put in place a strategic plan. And that strategic plan would be a plan that is trans-NIH, which means that it involves all of the institutes and centers, not isolated. So the next time, perhaps, when you hold a hearing like this, you would have all of NIH sitting at this table at one time to defend one document that we've put together to say, this is how we're going to do it. Secondly, as you know, anybody who's worked with a strategic plan, strategic plan brings with it another component. And that component is that it's an evaluation. It's something to hold the agency and those individuals who are responsible for that strategic plan accountable. And so I think the fact that there would be a strategic plan and accountability attached to that plan, that results would, would sur surely come. And finally, Dr. Bach, um, the, just going back to your study, because it, it, it is, it was one of the major factors that bring us here today. Um, do you do you think that I mean when you look at those differences of with regard to folks with the lung cancer, um, you you would believe that that's going on all over the country. You would have those kind of findings if you were to guess. I mean, just take first of all, how did you come up with the ten sites that you came up with? Well, um, so the last question I'll try and answer first. The ten sites uh, constitute the National Cancer Institute's ongoing cancer surveillance network called Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results, and nicknamed SEER. It's, it's the ongoing database we use for virtually all cancer statistics, and many of the statistics you've heard cited here today are from that database. And so that sample, although it's not a random sample, constitutes a cross-section of the United States. And uh, I would say that, on average, the results that we found uh, likely um, would hold true in most geographic regions of the U.S. that we did not sample. And although I don't have the numbers in front of me, I can tell you that we looked in individual geographic regions that are captured by that database, and uh, we found this consistent finding that black patients were less likely than whites uh, to undergo surgery. The thing, I guess, that concerns me and is uh, more personal than anything else is that when I look at the obituary page of the Baltimore Sun, what I see is a lot of African Americans who are dying of cancer at from 35 to 55, and um, and or heart disease. Um, I started looking at the obituary page a few years ago. I think after my 35th birthday, so I could value life a little bit more every day. But uh, in your study. You're dealing with 65 years and older. Would it change for that population, say the 35 to 55? Right. And would they make perhaps different decisions? Um, because, I mean, one of the th factors, I guess, that comes into play is if somebody's going to get surgery, 
Um, they have to look at the shape of their body, what kind of health, you know, whether they're healthy and whether they can withstand surgery, because I'm not a doctor, but I understand that surgery can have an impact on your body. And so I'm just wondering if that would change these figures a bit, you think? Uh, well, as, as I mentioned, we didn't look directly at the younger populations, and we did that for a special reason, which was that we wanted to control, uh, we use in the epidemiologic lingo, uh, control for insurance status. In other words, we wanted to be sure that if you weren't having surgery, it wasn't because you were uninsured. Um, in terms of the comment about uh, risk of surgery or the effect it can have on your body, we were able, because of the structure of this database that's maintained by the NCI, able to ascertain whether or not people were too sick to have surgery. Uh, it's a term, we, we use the term comorbidity to describe that, but uh, what I can tell you is that when we looked at black and white patients who had very low levels, medium levels, and high levels of comorbidity, comparing uh, within those different groups, in every case, black patients were less likely to have surgery than whites. Uh, to address your, the question you began this with, um, as I said, we didn't examine these data, but there was a study published approximately six months before ours um, which examined the rates of surgery for black patients uh, of all ages using the same database but uh, without the benefit of the insurance information that we had. And in that study also it was shown that the younger black Americans were less likely than the younger white Americans to have surgery. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We thank you for all your good questions. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I <clears throat> regret very much that I was not able to attend the entire hearing because this is a very special interest of mine. I'm very hopeful. Uh, I must say about cancer only a few years ago, I, literally, uh, it, I don't think people were talking about people living with cancer. It's almost like AIDS. People now live with AIDS. People live with cancer. Um, the elevation of the NIH Office of Research on minority concerns to an NIH center is, it seems to me, minimally necessary if we're serious about uh, tackling these disparities. I am told that if this is not done by the Congress, it may well be done administratively, that there may be the authority to do so. I certainly hope that does not become necessary. I think it would, would send a very bad message if somehow, given these disparities, we were not able to get uh, this done through the, through the Congress. And I'm certain that everyone in the Congress uh, understands and is sympathetic with the need here. Um, I, I'd just like to say a word since I did not hear the testimony about uh, my major concern, which is uh, prevention. We know that in some instances there is more cancer, in some instances there is less cancer. We are convinced that some of these are not merely human differences, but are ethnic differences. Until we find out more, we will not have a good way to get at these disparities. There will be a, a lot of continuing good guesswork on the part of physicians and healthcare professionals. I think we owe the minority communities a better than that. I'm particularly interested that there is less breast cancer among African American women, for example, but more cancer deaths. And everyone goes to the obvious, and that is, of course, that there is less access to health care. But I must say to you, I think we have an equal obligation to go to prevention here. If there are fewer cases of breast cancer or if they occur uh, less often, then it seems to me we have a better chance of preventing breast cancer among African Americans uh, than, than among whites. And one of the reasons we don't do so is because they don't have access to preventative care. But another reason is that uh, the preventatives that are now becoming known to middle class people and educated people are not wide enough known in the minority communities. I have a bill that is, I think, going to become a part of a an appropriation uh, on obesity that is going uh, before, uh, that is going to be passed in, as a part of the labor HHS appropriation. Uh, that, th that marks the first time that the Congress will uh, come forward with a large appropriation to combat obesity in this country. Now, that is an across-the-board problem in this country. Every age group, from the littlest children uh, till the oldest people, and every ethnic group. But I have to tell you that by sight, <laughs> 
I see so many people on the street in my community. They're headed for all kinds of problems uh, on, on the basis of obesity. And we certainly think that cancer is one of them. So that, that we can talk about all the, 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 the health care access we want to. But I am a whole lot less interested in pouring money at healthcare professionals to try to cure something than I am about preventing a terrible disease of, uh, like cancer. I would like to see a lot more emphasis put on uh, explaining to young people the link between all this fat food and all this stuff that lure, would lure anybody on the television, all this lack of exercise, and where it all ends up in, in, in the final analysis. Now, I did not hear testimony. Uh, uh, I was not privileged to hear your testimony, so do not know whether you were able to discuss prevention, but, but I would like, if, if, I'm not, if, if I'm not causing you to be redundant, to, to hear what you have to say about ordinary preventative uh, matters, not simply being able to go to the doctor to get your annual treatment. If we're going to wait for that, we're going to wait a long time for blacks and Hispanics to get equal. I want to I want to get st straight through, to get straight through that, and and get the message through that cancer is pre preventable. Uh, just like a lot of other diseases are preventable, but not if you're going to uh, eat yourself to death until you're 50 uh, and then expect that everything's going to come out all right because your grandma lived to be 95. Somehow we've got to break through the folk folklore and mythologies of our respective communities, and I wonder what the, what, what the medical and healthcare professionals have to say about uh, prevention as a way to go at, at cancer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I would like to address your question with a practical example of uh, my work at the Washington Hospital Center here in Washington, D.C. Eleven years ago, I started a radio show that started on December the 4th of 1989. And that show has been on the air every single day since then until today, for 11 years. It's broadcast three times a day. At the fifth year of doing this radio show, I opened a clinic that had a theme that said, this place only for healthy people. If you're sick, you go please see your primary care doctor. If you want to talk about cancer prevention, you want to get screened, come here. The administrators of my hospital told me, good luck, you want healthy people, number one, and then you want them to pay out of pocket because I knew that my community was uninsured. So I put a very low fee. In three weeks, we were booked for six months and so far, we have seen 7,500 people crossing our doors. 85% of these people, they are completely healthy, asymptomatic. 90% are Latinos. They are the people who are cleaning your houses, gardeners, waiters. And 90% of these people have less than high school education. Why is that? Because the message has crossed their minds every single day, three times a day, for 11 years. No, this is one side of the coin. Health, like to, preventive uh, health, what you're asking for, can be solved using the media with four premises. Number one, the message needs to be consistent. Consistent, in my opinion, means every single day. Can you imagine your 11 o'clock news without sports? Probably not. But there are many 11 o'clock news without health. Number two, the education needs to be comprehensive. There's no point on talking only about breast cancer or only about prostate cancer needs to be about obesity, cigarette smoking, seat belts, maternal and infant health, the whole comprehensive health education. Number three, we have to use the channels that the community uses. Some people love radio, others like television. People are on the internet already. Some people like to read. We have to produce materials for all of them, but every day. And number four, messages need to be delivered by someone that the community trusts and identifies with. So with this model, we have been able to attract all these thousands of people for preventive care. The other side of the coin, in my hospital, I ask, and this is new data that I'm going to publish, I ask my cancer control person at the hospital to please get me a list of all the advanced cancers that went to the hospital over the last five years. I was interested in breast cancer, prostate cancer, cervical cancer, and colorectal cancer, preventable, detectable, as you know. She came up with a list of 200 people. All of them, 
95% of them lived in the zip code 20010 and 20011, which are across my hospital. Stages three and four, advanced incurable cancers. Guess what? 98% of these people are fully insured. Medicare, Medicaid, commercial health insurance. That's the other side of the coin. Why do these people were waiting at their homes, letting their tumors grow? So this is the kind of thing that I meant when I said that our medical establishment is much more interested in finding the molecules, the genes, about the lady's tumor. I think we should be interested also in the lady herself. Why is this lady waiting so long? Thank you very much. I must say that was uh, itself a, a lesson in prevention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for asking the question. Uh, I've seen various academic relationships with working hospitals where sometimes the person is simply a case number when the students come in instead of saying, good morning, Joe, or good morning, Susie, how are you doing today? Uh, so I think we have uh, that breakdown that's needed in medical school that was mentioned. Uh, what else would you have the, uh, uh, we don't have interns anymore, we have residents, but while they're in medical school, what do you think they should be taught uh, to be sensitive to patients, especially of uh, different races and ethnicity? Yes. Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your question, Mr. Horn. I think they should be sent obligatorily to inner cities and to community clinics that serve multicultural populations. They should not graduate from medical school if they don't have that kind of a training. I would do that. I have students in my little clinic. and They are second year and first year medical students. So they haven't really go, gone through the whole medical studies. And they, when they have my Latino patients, when they have my poor African American patients, they really at the beginning, I can see their eyes. They are kind of uh, seeing different people, different cultures. But at the end of the rotation, which are three months, they can talk to them. They can, I can see their eyes. They are gliding because they have learned something, how to see different kind of cultures. I would be very tough. No graduation if you don't have training in treating multicultural people. I think that's an excellent suggestion. And as a uh, former university president, that's what I had the School of Education do. Don't put them out to the suburbs. Mm -hmm. Put them out where you've got to meet real people in the inner city. Uh, do individuals of very, Mr. Dr. Bach, this essentially goes to you. Do individuals of different ethnic backgrounds or races react differently to come with, uh, chemotherapy and radiation treatments? And how do some bear uh, better under those uh, chemotherapy and radiation treatments? Um, I, I actually, I may have to pass this question to one of the oncologists sitting to my right. Um, our study looked mostly, you know, in a large population of people using uh, administrative claims data. I can tell you that my impression as a clinician, and I'm a practicing pulmonologist at a cancer center, uh, is that uh, people of all ethnicities tend to um, withstand or benefit from treatment uh, to an equal extent, uh, regardless of their ethnicity. But uh, it may be that some of the oncologists to my right can further fill this in. Yeah, if I, if I may, sir, uh, as a medical oncologist who studies this sort of thing, uh, there's really no difference among the races in terms of chemotherapy or radiation. Uh, there are differences in, in terms of older people versus younger people, but not between blacks or whites or Hispanics. There will sometimes, however, be cultural differences in people complaining. Uh, certain cultures, for example, are much more accepting of pain and not voicing it, for example. Uh, Dr. Bach, uh, in your article on early stage cancer, you note about African-American patients not receiving the more effective treatment of surgical resection. As a part of this study, did you talk to the doctors? And if not, has there been any physician interviews to determine if racial bias is a problem in medicine? 
Um, in response to your first question, uh, our study was based, as I mentioned, in administrative claims data, and so we weren't able to either interview the patients who were involved or the physicians. Uh, the primary goal of the study was to get a population-based estimate of the extent to which both disparities in treatment existed and their impact on survival. And uh, by taking that approach, we had a trade-off. Um, we believe that our estimates are accurate. Um, but we lost the, the um, ability to get a good sense of why it was that there were treatment differences. I should tell you there's a great deal of research into the doctor-patient relationship um, that is attempting to explore this issue. And uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, the National Cancer Institute has uh, supported our research or continued to support our research into this area. And we hope that uh, part of the outgrowth of this finding will be um, better information based on patient and physician interviews. Well, I thank you for that. Uh, is there any other comments any of you would like to make? Because uh, my next question is to Dr. Thompson. So uh, do you have some thoughts on this, Dr. Thompson? On, well, on, the on question that question, right. I've got a different one for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, th there was a news announcement over the weekend mm -hmm. that a new recommendation is expected on when to begin PSA testing for all men, and in particular for African American men. Would you explain why this is so vital to catch it early? And if so, uh, well, a lot of people don't take uh, annual physical serious until maybe they're about 30 or 35, and they sense that they're aging rapidly. <laughs> so uh, what would your advice be? One of the, the, uh, the things that we know from the literature is, is uh, prostate cancer, based on what we know, is a little bit more lethal in African-American males. And I know when I talk with people about the problem of prostate cancer, we, the, many men are not aware of the issue. They, they um, don't get PSA testing. They don't get rectal exams. So we really do need to figure out a way to get the message out as early as possible and really teach early screening and, and treatment at an earlier age for all men dealing with issues of testicular cancer, uh, prostate cancer, all of those, just to make them aware of the problem like we do with women with self-breast exam is, and, and the whole idea of getting early treatment for uh, breast cancer, the educating the public, making them aware of the problem, telling them what to do, and encouraging them to talk with their doctor about, um, about getting the testing and getting the screening. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hurt, I believe, earlier in this uh, month, I know uh, thousands of people looked at the PBS series on the end of life care. Is there a difference to preferences and access to hospice care based on ethnicity? Hospice the, question is, the question is if there is a difference uh, between uh, people that choose different hospitals based on their ethnicity? On hospices, oh, hospice, hospice care based on ethnicity. Yes, uh, there are some differences. and There are some cultures, for example, the Latino culture, the Hispanic culture, they do not like to put their in, in home in hospices or uh, nursing in homes. They believe that they are, quote marks, dumping their families mm -hmm. and they are not taking care of them. So um, the same happened with Asian Americans. Uh, so there are definitely differences in culture regarding the use of these kind of health facilities. Well, thank you. Now I'm going to close this out and thank the staff, but before doing that, is there something that's come to your mind that a colleague has said that you'd like to comment on it? So we'll start with you, Dr. Ruffin. Anything to add to the record? Most of the um, questions uh, have centered around, to some extent, the elevation of the Office of Research on Minority Health uh, to center status. Much of Mr. Jackson's testimony uh, also had much to do with, with that, um, that same subject. And I think the only thing that I would say um, for the record is that it be clearly understood that um, uh, this is not 
uh, something new for the National Institutes of Health. Uh, in many instances where issues have come to the forefront and where compelling data warrant it, uh, we have responded in similar manners. We need only look to the Genome Institute now uh, as guidance to that, and we'll see that a few years ago, uh, we were talking about a genome center, which was elevated to institute status. Just last year, alternative medicine became very inter of interest uh, to us in this country. Alternative medicine, which was an office very much like the office that I now run, is now a center. Nursing was a center, which is now an institute. So in most instances at the National Institutes of Health, when we've recognized the importance uh, of an issue, we have elevated that issue in many instances by elevating the status uh, of that unit. And so I just wanted to make it clear that this is not groundbreaking. This is not a new um, uh, for us, but a model that we have followed with many of the other entities at the National Institutes of Health. Thank you. Dr. Freeman, anything to add? Yes, Congressman. Uh, yes, Congressman. Uh, uh, three, three points uh, related to the discussion uh, on prevention, which was raised by Congressman Norton. Um, primary prevention is believed to be able to prevent at least two thirds of cancers. A third of cancers are due to, to smoking, another third related to diet, and some others due to exposure to the sun. And then there's secondary prevention. For example, it is believed, although currently 55,000 American people die of colon cancer every year, disproportionately poor and black, um, it is believed that we can prevent most, or at least half of those cancers can be prevented by what is called secondary prevention. If everyone at a certain age, which is believed to be 50 years old, had total colonoscopy, we can make a big dent into, into colon cancer deaths, which is a prevention. Uh, no woman should die of cervical cancer. We still have 5,000 deaths a year, but we can diagnose that cancer before it becomes invasive. Uh, breast cancer is now being operated on at the point before it becomes invaded, uh, invasive. So the, the, this is one set of things. Prevention is critical, and I, I appreciate your comments. The second thing is that not only are Dr. Bach's findings important in the lung, but the, over the last seven years, since 1993, we've had about a dozen peer-reviewed papers that show racial differences in the treatment of cancer and other diseases and, and the treatment of pain. Um, there are two studies that show that black and African-American people in emergency rooms who present with long bone fractures, which are very painful, uh, are, are less likely to be treated with morphine compared to others. There's another study from Harvard that has shown that black American people are less likely to be referred for renal transplantation when they're in renal failure, correcting for everything else, including uh, insurance. Uh, there are studies that show that black Americans are less likely to be worked up fully for symptoms that might mean they have life-threatening coronary heart disease. So I want to put in perspective that we're not only talking about one problem, we're talking about a societal set of issues that affect black Americans. And, and, the, and, the, and the final thing, um, I think that in the prostate cancer, you raised the question about mm -hmm. the PSA. I have two concerns. Uh, number one is that we don't have all of the scientific answers as to which prostate cancer will progress uh, or, and, and which will remain dormant. Um, and so the question of, the, and the treatment is not, there's a lot of debate about how to treat this disease. A radical prostatectomy versus radiation in its two forms and watchful waiting. Uh, we had a mayor in New York who, who, who waited about three months uh, after diagnosis because he had to think it over. What happens in poor communities, poor black communities, when there's no counseling? They don't know the, 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 there's the, these, these, these options, they're not explained. So if we bring in screening in a poor community, we should bring in counseling along with it. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Dr. Brawley? 
Thank you for the opportunity, sir. Um, Dr. Freeman's been wonderful in explaining that this problem is not just in cancer. Uh, and it, and I, I can focus directly on cancer and tell you that there are studies in the literature in colon, breast, prostate, cervix, and lung cancer that show that there are disparities in treatment. There's also studies in the literature that show that the equal treatment yields equal outcome in all of those cancers, sometimes by looking at a specific hospital that for some reason or another is actually able to offer that good therapy, other times looking at systems like the military. What it boils down to me, it appears, is not just access to care, which is what we frequently worried about when talking about especially poor people, but also acceptability of care. Uh, Nancy Breen at the National Cancer Institute, for example, published a study last year that showed one out of five black women with breast cancer gets less than optimal care. They get care, but less than optimal care. It's actually one out of eight white women who get less than optimal care. Uh, so where people get their care and is that care optimal, is that care acceptable, are, are real issues. And I can't overstress the fact that there are hospitals where people actually go and start getting care and literally walk away because of inconvenience. Uh, sometimes it's because of the faculty being uh, not sensitive. Sometimes it's because of basic issues of having to wait for four or six hours to see a physician. Thank you. Dr. Bach, uh, any last thoughts? Uh, I only want to thank you for considering the results of our study and uh, say that uh, we certainly hope that it, it leads to progress and improved treatment of people with uh, lung cancer as well as the other conditions that have been mentioned. Thank you. Dr. Thompson, any thoughts? Sure. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to make a comment about the professional nursing. Um, someone made a comment earlier about the number of African-American nurses, we only have 4% of, of nurses um, who are African-American in this country, so we really do need to figure out a way to increase that number. The other um, comment I wanted to make is, is this whole idea of sustaining programs that work. There are, are many studies that have been conducted and demonstration pilot programs that have been uh, placed in communities and their funding uh, they, they only go on as long as the funding is available. And when we know things work and we know that it's having an impact on reaching people and reducing problems, especially in relationship to pre prevention, we really need to figure out better ways to take those programs to scale and sustain them um, um, instead of the funding that currently happens only looking at demonstration for three to five years. Thank you. Dr. Huerta, your yes, last thank you. words. Thank you. Um, I would like to talk about prevention that Ms. Norton uh, talked about. There is this wonderful program from CDC, for example, called the Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, which I am enrolled to do here in the district. There is a wonderful program here in the district called WISH, Wish Women Into Staying Healthy, which is a CDC program. And I'm a member of that. But you know what? We call women, we lure women. Come here, please, it's for free. Your mammogram, your pap smear, come here, come here. Well, I have, uh, I have seen 6,000 Latino women and 200 African-American women, and I have found already three cancers among the African-American women. But that's not the point. The point is that this program has no treatment component. So when I diagnose these cancers, I'm between a sword and the wall. Because on one side, my patient is telling me, why did you call me here? And on the other side, my hospital is saying, Dr. Huerta, we have to pay for this? Are you doing this kind of business to us? In other words, I'm being punished for being a good citizen. Well, that's a sad situation, to say the least. I want to thank, and I want to thank each of you. It's been a very good hearing in terms of getting things on the record. Uh, let me thank the staff for both the majority and the minority. Uh, on my uh, left, your right, is Beth Clay, the majority counsel. The back of her is T.J. Light, the legislative aide. And uh, our clerks uh, for the majority, Bob Briggs and uh, Mike Canty. And then for the minority counsel is Sarah Dupree and uh, the 
minority legislative aide is Tanya Shand, and uh, the uh, minority clerks, Jean Gosa, and uh, our faithful court reporters are Codeine Lynch and Leanne Dotson. And we thank you all. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Here's what's ahead on CC.